Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Conscious Grief Series. My name is Tara Nash, and today I am joined by Micah Mullenders. Micah is an author and a yoga teacher. So welcome. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. It's really lovely to have you here. And I I read your memoir, which I have here, and it's called The Confession, A Journey to Acceptance. So maybe you could begin with sharing about your story in a nutshell and what yeah. brought you to writing a memoir. So I've intended to write it for a long time. I started writing it maybe 20 years ago because I felt that it was an unusual story. And I think I wanted to share just my my journey in the hope that maybe it would support others. So that's not a nutshell. I will get there. Um, I lost my father to suicide when I was 21. And this came after him having made various attempts on his own life when I was much younger. So it was something that I'd always lived in the shadow of. So there was that complicated form of grief. But then on top of that, he left behind a confession to the police saying that he had been inappropriate with me, which was something that I had no memory of. So it it kind of took over. I, be, I guess I became a bit obsessed with knowing was that the truth or not. And so the book really talks about my journey from, from that moment and how I then came to a point of peace I guess and an acceptance that that maybe I would never know the truth and that I I had to live from that point I couldn't get hooked in in needing to know the truth so um yeah that's that's it in Um, in brief yeah I know it's it's a big question (laughs) to get into, you know, it's a whole book to get into one answer, but it is a really fascinating story. And survivors of suicide are often left with complicated grief. And, you know, there can be a lot of stigma around suicide. And you you remind me, you're in your early 20s, Yes, so I was I was 21. I was about to go into my third year at university and I guess nobody knew how to talk about grief at that at that stage in their lives. We were all very young. What did happen was that a fellow student lost her father to to cancer and I guess I experienced that people had slightly more words to give to her it was less awkward and so I really just buried my grief completely um I was doing an actor's training my third year was all about public performance I'd worked really hard so I just threw myself into into that final year And I guess because my father had always suffered with mental health issues throughout his life, um, he first tried to take his own life when I was 11. I'd I'd got very good at just pushing (laughs) pushing my emotions down, incredibly unhealthy coping strategy, but it it was what my mother did as well. And I just copied that. Um, and so when my father then did pass away, that was exactly the strategy I used. I just didn't feel it for a very, very long time. And then particularly because there was all the the added complication of, of the confession around it. So it took, yeah, I would say it took me many, many years to to come to a point where I could even feel grief um or that I could even acknowledge that that there was sadness and and loss so yeah I think that it's you know I'm relating a lot to what you're saying because I was 21 when 
my mum died and I was at university. I also kind of replicated how she had dealt with the grief of my father and stayed busy and carried on. And it is interesting, you know, that when it really kind of comes up in our life later on as adults, you know, we think we're adults at 21. Um, uh, but they say if you lose a parent bef- at, at the age of 25 or younger, you know, you're still a child because our be- our brain is not fully developed until we're 25. Um, what time in your life did the grief start to surface or you started having the awareness that you had these emotions pushed down? that you needed to attend to? Uh, I think I started to realize that I was really struggling in relationships. And it was that inability to trust or to feel safe. And so I kept sort of fulfilling the same pattern, really, that I was desperate to be in a relationship. I was desperate to have connection. I was desperate to... I guess maybe in the relationships I was looking for for that stability that I'd never had. And then every time those relationships didn't work, I more and more started to go, what's, what's going on with me? What's wrong with me? And so I think it was when I was 30 that I really properly started having therapy to address those issues. And I had had therapy previously but I think it wasn't until I was 30 that I really went I want something needs to shift something needs to change and I think what was interesting was what the what the therapy gave me was an understanding of why I was doing what I was doing and where where this behavior was coming from but it didn't help me to change the behavior as such it it helped me to be more understanding of myself but it didn't help me to to change the behavior and it wasn't actually until i started practicing yoga that i really felt able to shift and i got a i think i had very little sense of self worth because the child part of me had that sense of, well, if my father is going to to take his own life, then clearly I'm not worth staying alive for. And obviously now as an adult, I understand he had all of his own issues, but that child part very strongly felt I'm I'm not worth being here for. And so... I've kind of lost my point, but I was talking about that, I guess, that lack of self-worth. And it wasn't until I started training in yoga that I sort of started to get a sense that I could have, um, I could instigate change in my own life. I did have some power and and resilience. So, so yeah, I think the the journey was twofold. It was initially the therapy, and I worked with an amazing therapist who just made me feel safe to be able to to break, I guess. And and I think that's what I had to do. You know, it'll be interesting to see what what other people have to say about grief. But my experience is that you can't run from it it will it will catch up with you somewhere and i think yeah at that point it caught up with me and i and i cried and i yeah and i raged and i sobbed and it it came out there but it hadn't come out all those years before i i didn't cry when it first happened it was yeah i was numb mm-hmm. so yeah i would i would say about 30 was when it really had to happen. I um, love what you're sharing, uh, what you're sharing about the therapist made you feel safe. And I think this is such an important part of of healing um, to find people that we feel safe with and and the right therapist. And you're and it's really fascinating to hear how you feel and the yoga, you know, you did a yoga teacher training. So 
that was also in relationship with the teacher and the other people who are in that container, um, which is a very powerful, you know, anyone who has done a yoga teacher training, I mean, it's a very, very deep emotional work. It's not just uh, learning how to teach yoga, is it? It's <clears throat> it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do for people who may never want to be a yoga teacher because you get so much out of it from a very deep personal level. And like you were saying, that combination of the therapy and the and then you were saying the yoga really helped you believe that you could create a different reality. Yeah, yeah. And I think what you've just said that that's really important as well is that sense of community. And I think that's what I hadn't felt when I was younger. I hadn't felt able to share my authentic self, who whoever that was, whether that was a grieving child, whether that was um, a young woman trying to find her her space in the world. I just always felt that I had to put on a front. And I was so busy putting on that front and that took so much energy, you know, that front of I'm normal, I'm okay. Because of course that was also my other fear was my dad's taken this action. He's he struggled with his mental health. Am I okay? What if what if I start to struggle? And there, there is a point that I actually describe in in the book where I'm so lost that I feel as if I'm on this line where I can step into insanity or I can step into staying in the world and i would i would say that was probably my my lowest point where i just i almost wanted to step into insanity because the energy that it took to to stay in the here and now was was so much um but yeah i think community for me has been incredibly important feeling like i belong and and both in my therapy because I also did group therapy then, and in the yoga teach training, as you say, you become part of this wonderful community of really diverse people. And again, you know, I had a an amazing teacher trainer. So I feel, yeah, I feel I sometimes go, gosh, what would have happened if you hadn't met these amazing people? But I guess it's also being open to those amazing people when you meet them. Yeah, it is. And and having the courage uh, to do these self-development things, you know, because it can be very, very intimidating to be in a group, to talk and to be authentic, maybe for the first time in your whole life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also then the pain of realising that you haven't been authentic for so long, that you have, I don't know, I don't like to think of it as wasting time. I like to think of it as I needed to go through that to get to to where I am now. But yeah, it's... Um, I mean, grieving time is a, is a real thing. Um, you know, a lot of people go through that like oh my gosh I can't believe I stayed in a relation an abusive relationship for so long or I can't believe I only know about these tools or way of being at this point in my life and you know this is where grief can show up in in so many different forms and um you know you are obviously so committed to wanting to have the, a good relationship and a family and that's what inspired you to do to do this work and I know from reading your book you had a very isolated childhood as well yeah it's like a really big you know and an even bigger step for you to have you know done what you've done and achieved what you have done in your life yeah and and I think I've I would say I've genuinely found peace with with all of it um it I just feel so blessed to be where I am now. I feel I know I've really worked hard to get here, but it's almost like I can really draw it into myself. I can really appreciate it in a way that that I never 
did previously. Um, and I guess that's also through through the yoga teacher training. But it's interesting talking, you said mentioning time and and grieving time. And I do sometimes think, gosh, if I'd have had the yogic principles. So, for example, the yamas and the niyamas, you know, just do no harm, particularly then also to yourself. All the, all these beautiful principles, non-attachment, letting go of expectation. And if I'd had those when I was younger, wow. But what's funny is that I now try to talk to my children about those principles and they're like, oh, come on, mom, you know, give it a break. And and so I also just think you you have to come to things when the time is is right mm. um, yeah so yeah, there's that the old saying um that, you know when you're ready the teacher will come I don't think that's quite the right way of saying it but that's you know the lear- yeah the learning or the theory or the, yeah mm. um, now go, come, let's coming circling back to the grief of your father because your father was a complex character and you know which you captivate him so well in your writing in your book and as we've touched upon it was it was a complex grief that you had and there was also a sort of sense of relief in some way when he passed away so yeah I'll let you yeah absolutely and I guess because I'd been living with that for such a long time that there was this risk that he would take his own life. And it was kind of, it hung over my behavior as, as a child in terms of going, well, if I'm good enough, if I, if I don't rock the boat, um, then, then he won't do it, which of course, again, is, is a child's thinking. But, but for me at that time, that was very real. He also, he put a lot of pressure on me to to achieve to become something and um so when he finally passed away there was a sense of of being able to exhale um just a sense of of yeah relief which obviously in itself that's that's a really challenging thing to have to say i was i was relieved when my my father passed away um but i think i'd been managing in my own childish way him for such a long time that that yeah it really was a sense of of relief um and i think what's been really talking again then about community what's been really valuable for me is that i've started to run my local survivors of bereavement by suicide group and actually it's been wonderful and really sort of healing 25 years on to hear people speak there because this relief is something that a lot of people mention and so then for for me on a very personal level I can just go okay it's okay you know um and i do think that's what makes that that group so valuable is that people can can share like you you called it complex grief it's exactly what it is um yeah i think like in fact i remember i i i talk about it in the book but i remember having a nightmare very shortly after he'd passed away that he was actually still alive and I was just going it can't he can't be he can't be and my whole system and body just went into panic which again is is an indication that that his passing somehow freed me um yeah yeah thank you so much for sharing that I know that, uh, you know, uh, so many people need to hear this message. Uh, A lot of the time, um, you know, more, most of the time I interview people and and their relationship is one of, you know, that 
deep pain and sadness because the love was so strong. And But there's also a lot of people, you know, even if you didn't have a good relationship with someone, it doesn't mean to say you're not going to grieve. I mean, Absolutely. this is your parent. This is somebody that you have a bond with. And, you know, whether it, it I mean, I know people who've got uh, kids who were drug addicts, you know, and then they passed away and and there, there was the relief because it was always a challenge um, that was happening in their day-to-day -day lives. And people feel shame about this. You know, it's a bit of, you know, a taboo thing to say, but this is this is really the reality for a lot of people. Totally. And I think also I grieved and, and this was came out a lot in my in my therapy. I grieved what wasn't. I grieved the father that I would have liked to have had um, and the relationship that I would have liked to have had. And now, you know, I see my children with their father and I go, you know, it's not perfect, but there's a, there's a lightness about it. There's a joking, there's a teasing, there isn't this, this intensity that, that I felt when I was, was growing up. So, um, yeah, I think there are, there are many aspects of, of of that that grief and it's just I guess for me my big thing now is having written the book that I think it's just really important that we all share our humanness and and all of it you know not just the beautiful bits but but the complex bits because I really think we can well I guess that's why you're doing this series you know we can really help each other if we if we share we really can. I, I just think there's nothing nothing more healing than hearing other people's stories. And I always say we're, we are all teachers for one another. And you've done group therapy and know the power of that, the power of listening to other people and hearing their experiences and seeing us in them. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, you know, there are mo there were moments in my group therapy that I went, oh, you met someone who behaved in the way I did and you interpreted it completely differently than I intended. You know, so you do, you see lights coming on of, of your own behaviour and, and it just reflects it back and you, you start to see the world through different lenses and other people's understanding of it. And it's, yeah, it's incredibly powerful. Mm, it really yeah. is there is quite nothing quite like group therapy I think yeah but it's it's also confronting very <laughs> confronting to, you have to um be I think in a particular space and and as well as as I said before it, it needs to be with someone who can hold that that space as well for mm. for the participants Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, would, what would you say um, about grief that, that, that maybe some of the sort of misconceptions that we might have around how grief should look and how we kind of judge ourselves, and, you know, maybe for not doing it right or not doing it enough or, yeah. Yeah, I would say it's, it's your own journey and yes if I could go back and do mine again I would do it differently but you know we're all very wise in retrospect I think just give yourself a break I mean I think the thing that I would always say is give it space because I didn't give it space but then you know you're you can't plan this perfect grieving process. I think it's really important to have people around you who you can talk to, but equally there'll be days when you don't want to talk. There'll be days when you just want to pretend it hasn't happened. I think all those things are, are valid because I think if you, if you just are just in the grief the whole time, you'd, you'd combust it's it's too much you have to 
take little gasps of of air as well. It's I had a very I don't know, it was to say it's interesting is probably the wrong word, but a friend of mine lost her partner recently. And I was really surprised by how painful I found it to see her in so much pain. And I I find myself trying to solve it, which of course isn't possible. And yeah, it's just that realization that it it's horrible. It's it's not a nice feeling and but I guess it's just trying to build things around yourself while you're in that process, whether it's family, friends, whether it's therapy, um, whether it's, I, I think it can be expressed in many different ways as well. You know, you can express it through art. You can go into the woods. You can scream as loud as you can. You know, that I I don't think there's a right way. And I think, yeah, it can look ugly, you know, um, at, the, at the moments of my most intense therapy, you know, I was just streaming with tears and just think you have to allow it in, in as much and when you feel comfortable. But I think a, a safe a safe space is is really important, however that looks to you. Um, I know for me, I never felt safe crying on my own. I was very frightened that I would fall apart. And so for me, it was finding people that I felt safe with. Um, and, you know, even even now, if I'm watching a film and there's suicide on the film, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a jolt. But, you know, my... My husband knows the situation. He'll sort of put his hand on my knee. I think I think it's letting people know who you are with your grief as well. Um, Hold on one second. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I, I knew something was coming at this time. That's oh, what... don't worry. Um, but I think you got to the end of that question. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to ask you um, about, I mean, you've kind of almost said it as well, but I'll ask you how you would define conscious grief. Right, yeah. okay. Um, Micah, I always like to ask every participant, um, how would you define conscious grief? Um, that's a big one. I guess, I guess being, being aware that you are in a process. So for me, the grief was so pushed down and there was so much complexity on top of it that I just didn't feel it. Um, and and so, yeah, an awareness that you are on a on a journey. So this this thing happens, this loss, sometimes expected, sometimes unexpected, and then just allowing yourself to. I guess it's interesting, isn't it? Because you have to accept you have to accept that it's happened before you can be conscious about your grief. Um, but yeah, I would say just allowing, allowing it and and giving space to it, actually respecting the grief rather than trying to, I'm going to go through a process. So I go to therapy, I do this, I do that. Just, yeah, res respect the grief and, and the, the grief is, you know, the grief is part of the love as well. Um, so trying not to, that it doesn't have to look a particular way. Yeah, I think. 
I, I really love that the way you were saying it's something to be respected. And, and I think that as so many of us are used to being able to control so many things and grief isn't something we can control, you know, and that's why we need to respect it really. Yeah. And, and share it, you know, again, share this stuff share our experiences because then we can help each other we can normalize stuff we we take people out of out of isolation which is the risk when you're in grief and and like you say that doesn't necessarily just have to be grief of a of a loved one it, grief is is in any in anything you know losing a job um, losing a relationship yeah yeah thank you Micah and now you have um a free free gift so perhaps you'd like to tell us I do I'm more than happy to give away two let me see them two copies of my of my book so yes if you're interested do do get in touch and um very kind of you. Thank you so much. And is there anything else you'd like to um, share before we finish? Um, just that I think it's amazing that this event is happening. I know it's the, the fifth one, but just thank you for letting me be part of it. And um, yeah, I hope I hope these conversations continue in many different forums and in many different genres. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank yeah. you to everybody who's been looking and listening today. Bye. Yeah. Take care. Bye.